I'm Sevil Mikhailova. And I'm Klaus Alhani, and this is This Week in Focus. And this week we will focus on Iran's uh, nuclear issue, the, the P5 plus 1 uh, negotiations, and the possibly lifting of sanctions. As the time is nearing, uh, that, as the sites uh, announced before, so they are going to sign this long-awaited and unexpected deal in June, there are too many views over this view. And some people s think it will happen, some people think it will not happen at all. And we'll try to get today to discuss and to find a question to this uh, question. Will it happen or not? Indeed. And um, our guest today is Claire Lopez, who is um, a, someone who's been following the Iranian issue for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. She's the vice president for research and analysis at the Center for Security Policy in Washington, D.C. Welcome to our program, This Week in Focus. Thank you. Glad to be with you. We have a number of questions for you today um, dealing with Iran. The, as you know, the sanctions uh, are, are being lifted. Uh, the P5, P5 plus one have reached an agreement with, with Iran. Does that mean that Iran is turning the corner? Does it mean that they're going to uh, respect the agreement? Does it mean they're going to toe the line, so to speak? Well, the first thing I would say is that I don't think we're quite to an agreement yet. What the uh, P5 plus one in Iran uh, apparently discussed um, towards the end of March um, in Lausanne, Switzerland, was what they called a framework for an agreement to be discussed before the end of June. Um, and they outlined uh, various various topics that they would be continuing to discuss. But the problem was that when the reports of the framework came out, uh, each party seemed to have a different version. Iran had one version, France had another, the EU had another, the United States State Department released a different one entirely, and the uh, leadership of the Iranian regime immediately branded Secretary of State John Kerry and the State Department liars. So I'm not completely sure where we are um, in terms of that framework. I think there's some talking yet to be done. Um, and then the other part of that was about sanctions, which... Um, would need to be uh, lifted by the United States Congress. Um, and there are leaders in Congress, such as Senator Bob Corker, um, leading a, uh, a push to um, demand a role for the Congress, in particular the Senate, which under the United States Constitution um, is to have a, a role for advice and consent is the way the Constitution puts it, on uh, foreign uh, deals or uh, uh, agreements, uh, treaties, and they are demanding a role for this one. Sorry, sorry, Claire, but uh, the, the rest statements was that we heard of immediately after the talks, after the Lausanne meeting, that the sides are optimistic and they are going to sign a deal uh, in June. Yes, well... Um, I think perhaps we might wait a bit. Um, I am not confident, and I, I don't think all the sides are very confident that that final deal will be reached. Uh, as, as you just said, the Supreme Leader in Iran and the Iranian side are demanding uh, an immediate lifting of the sanctions if and when such a framework uh, or agreement is reached on the basis of the framework. Uh, the United States side says no. Those sanctions are supposed to be lifted gradually if and as Iran complies with terms. So I think that the sides are really nowhere near agreement, if, if truth be told. Are we being railroaded into an agreement? Well, I think that the uh, Obama administration and Kerry State Department badly want an agreement. I think they very much want this to be their legacy for, um, you know, this administration. Um, but Congress, as I said, is, is, is not falling for that. They, they are demanding a role, um, in, in, uh, you know, the approval of anything that, that is agreed upon, uh, among the parties. Anyway, the sides are confirming that they have reached an initial agreement, they have a framework agreement, and they are going to sign it. Let's speak about the futures. So let's imagine that in June they will sign this agreement. Uh, how do you think uh, and how do you view the future of the region after signing of this agreement to lift the sanctions? 
Well, I think that the achievement um, of nuclear deliverable nuclear weapon status, of course, is is a very high uh, objective for the Iranian regime. Um, and uh, if they were to achieve that, they would obviously become hegemon uh, without a question of the entire region. Um, we can see that geostrategically they're already expanding their, uh, their reach. Uh, they've already dominated Lebanon for a very long time. Of course, uh, they are the only thing that is, is propping up the regime of Bashar al-Assad in Damascus. Um, Baghdad is their, is their puppet. And now uh, Iranian proxies, the, the tribe called the Houthis, have uh, taken over the capital of Yemen and are driving uh, against uh, Aden on the uh, very critical waterway, the Bab al-Mandeb. So all of these things um, speak, I think, to the Iranian um, intent to be the regional hegemon. I think the United States is on board with that and ready to let them do that. However, in terms of the region, I think the other countries, in particular the Sunni states of the Gulf uh, region, led by Saudi Arabia, uh, find this alarming. And one of the most alarming outcomes uh, that we're already seeing begin to take place um, is a move towards additional nuclear proliferation. For instance, the Saudi uh, discussions with the Pakistanis. And that, of course, would be one of the most destabilizing outcomes that could possibly be imagined. Uh, that was understandable from the very beginning, but uh, the parties uh, were in offensive uh, positions for 30 years, but now they are at a table of talks, and I think there were some factors, some drives for them to make them to sit at least at a table of talk, talks and uh, achieve a framework agreement. And how do you think, what were the interests or what were the drives for such an agreement? Well, it's to legitimize the overt uh, Iranian nuclear weapons program. Um, you'll recall that about 25 years ago, uh, in, no, let's see, I'm sorry, 15 years ago, in 2002, okay, let, we'll, we'll do this one over again. You'll recall that 15 years ago, in the year 2002, um, was the first time that the world actually got a look at the Iranian nuclear weapons program, which before that point, dating back to its beginnings in the 1980s, had been completely clandestine. And the Iranian opposition group, the National Council of Resistance of Iran, publicized it in that year. Um, and so from that point onwards, those facilities revealed Natanz, Isfahan, uh, Iraq, that is the place where they've got the heavy water reactor that can produce plutonium for a parallel route to a bomb. Uh, those places were now public. And so that's what the P5 plus 1 and Iran and the IAE have all been discussing, those, those, those places that are already overtly revealed. But, of course, that's no longer where the program is at. The program, at the point of being revealed in those places, went underground. And so the clandestine program is, is uh, the thing that we don't know about um, under the mountains, really literally dug under the mountains into tunnels and bunkers, uh, deeply buried. And so um, what Iran achieves, if they do, with this agreement would be um, a world acknowledgement for its overt program. Uh, it would be allowed to continue um, enrichment of uranium. It would be allowed to keep all of its sites um, completely contrary, by the way, to six United Nations Security Council resolutions, which demanded a halt to all uh, enrichment and a closing down of Fardo. Um, they would also be able to keep all their stockpile of enriched uranium that they've already got. They would be permitted to keep all their centrifuges. They would be permitted to keep on developing newer models, uh, faster models of centrifuges. Um, and they would also be able to com uh, continue uh, and, and complete work uh, at ARAC, the heavy water reactor, which uh, it's, it's sort of vague in the framework agreement that they would somehow convert that to a light water reactor, except that technologically that's not feasible. So that's a little bit uncertain. But they would get to keep all that. That sounds like another, yeah. another lost in translation. Um, yeah, something like that, yeah. Light water, okay.
Can you explain why they are so cautious about the Iranian have Iran's having uh, such a nuclear bomb? So if you if you see at the region, uh, so we'll see many countries um, nearby Iran having these nuclear uh, weapons bombs. What, why they are so cautious about Iran? Well, for one reason, uh, Iran is a signatory to something called the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, under which um, it agreed. Uh, never to develop nuclear weapons or the technology that could lead to nuclear weapons. So it remains a signatory to that. Uh, Pakistan, uh, uh, India, Israel, they are not signatories to that treaty, and so they're not bound by it, but Iran is. And the other reason to be cautious about Iran, of course, uh, in, in addition to a violation of that treaty and, and uh, the proliferation aspects that I referred to earlier, um, the fact that neighboring and uh, adversary um, nations in the region would also want a nuclear capability were Iran to demonstrably have one, um, which would be exceedingly dangerous in a volatile region like that. Surely, let's assume, let's assume for a minute that they do, deliver, do acquire nuclear weapons, which they probably will. There's a limit to how many nuclear bombs they can build in, in the first few years. Would you agree with me so far? Well, except that I think they probably already have quite a few nuclear warheads, and they've probably already tested them in their cooperative relationship at a minimum with North Korea. But So they already probably have quite a stockpile already. Yeah, but I, I don't think they have that much of a stockpile. But compared to what the West has, when you think that uh, France has over 350 uh, mm -hmm. nuclear bombs, the U.K. has more than 400, and the U.S. has 18 hundred or, or probably more than that, um, the retaliation would, would wipe out Iran off the map if, if, if it ever came to that. And I don't think the, the, they may be thinking to, to, to uh, expedite the, the, the matter with the Mahdi and all that, but I don't think they're, they're, they're crazy. I don't think they're suicidal in that, to that point. Well, I, I don't know if, if, if your, um, your viewers are familiar with something called an EMP weapon, electromagnetic pulse weapon. Um, this is a smallish sized um, nuclear bomb uh, exploded in the high atmosphere, which causes no immediate damage or death on Earth, but rather sends a stream of gamma rays down through the atmosphere uh, with the possibility of uh, wiping out, destroying uh, the electric grid. Now, uh, the United States civilian electric grid is completely unprotected. It has no shielding whatsoever. And um, a, a single, just one, EMP weapon like that exploded over the United States would take down our grid. And if that were to happen, uh, a series of some 11 federally funded, congressionally mandated studies over the past decade or so uh, have agreed that within one year, due to loss of all electricity, transportation, communication, medical services, uh, you name it, uh, within one year, nine out of ten Americans would be dead of starvation, of lack of medical care, and um, in the civil wars that would erupt. So. Um, in this sense, it only takes one. Iran, of course, already has an ICBM inventory, um, intercontinental ballistic missile uh, inventory, uh, capable, in terms of range at least, of reaching continental United States right now, today, 2015, from Iran. So uh, they don't even need an inventory. All they need is one. Uh, but Claire, Iran, uh, in fact, lived under sanctions for 30 years and it has sanctions hit economy and uh, the country, the people of the country are suffering from these sanctions. So uh, how do you think, uh, can it make uh, compromises uh, to, to achieve this agreement, this long-awaited agreement? Well, you know, um, you mentioned the, the years of sanctions, which indeed have been more and more strict, harsher and harsher. Um, but if you actually take a look at the quarterly reports issued by the IAEA, uh, they put them out three times a year uh, on the Internet in English. Um, these reports show that as the sanctions began to bite harder and harder um, against the Iranian economy, um, the Iranian nuclear program actually accelerated. 
Uh, it accelerated in terms of how much uranium was being um, uh, enriched. It accelerated in terms of the number of centrifuges. It enriched in terms of the generations um, of the newer and better centrifuges. Um, and so over the period of years, let's say I would date it from about November 2011 when we saw a really comprehensive report out of the IAEA and then forward, um, you can see that the Iranian nuclear weapons program actually accelerated under the sanctions. What is on table, uh, so sooner or later the parties are closing to an agreement. Let, let's speak about the perspectives of the region. So imagine that Iran is uh, returning to the market. Iran is becoming a major or one of the major players on the market. And how will it change the whole scene in the region? Well, um, in terms of its own um, economy and uh, ability to export, and, and especially export oil and, and gas, uh, we're already seeing a turnaround for the Iranian economy because um, sanctions have already been eased and uh, lots of uh, formerly frozen Iranian funds have been released to the tune of billions of dollars. So we're already getting sort of a view of, of, of what's going to happen and uh, their economy is picking up, inflation is down, uh, unemployment has held more or less steady at the moment, uh, but the value of the national currency, the rial, has increased. Um, so we already see these effects, um, and we see, of course, an increase in the ability of Iran to, to export. So, you know, those would be um, some of the things we'd see, and of course, all the benefits of that um, improved economy uh, would accrue to the regime, of course, not to the people, um, and to the IRGC, the guns that keep the regime in power. Um, the the uh, region perhaps could benefit from um, an eased flow of of uh, trade uh, in in the countries around Iran. I think that's that's a possibility too. Claire, how do you see uh, Azerbaijan being affected? Well, again, being um, a very close regional neighbor of of Iran. Um, that uh, easing of, of trade restrictions and, and uh, you know, increased possibility for trade could accrue to the benefit of Azerbaijan. Um, there are, of course, the, the ongoing um, conflicts and discussions over um, oil in the region. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the regional oil, Caspian Sea oil, and those sorts of things to be worked out. Um, but in terms of, of trade, I think uh, possibly... Um, it could be a, be a benefit for Azerbaijan as well as other countries in the near, um, you know, the near vicinity of Iran. Of course, um, this all supposes. Don't you think this isolation of Iran, uh, so for almost 30 years, it made it more aggressive? So if once they decided to leave the sanctions and to uh, to uh, revive its uh, participation in international organizations, in international economy, in international pol politics, so that will uh, contribute uh, to uh, that, that will contribute to the regional policy and that can uh, somehow um, soften Iran's position. I think we perhaps exaggerate when, when we think of Iran as having been isolated um, over these years. They, they haven't been isolated at all, uh, except more recently perhaps in terms of um, access to international financial markets, and that's the result of the sanctions, but only really uh, that, that result in the last few years. Um, but they haven't really been isolated at all. They have plenty of uh, trading partners who are um, needing their oil and gas. Um, I would think in particular of Asian countries. Um, I would think of the very close uh, working relationship uh, that Iran has always maintained with Russia, Soviet Union previous to, uh, to that. Um, and uh, Russia, of course, has, has uh, supported uh, Iran in so many different ways from training and weapons and uh, technology for its WMD programs, of course, not just nuclear, but uh, the biological weapons program, the chemical weapons program, and its nuclear uh, missile, or its ballistic missile, I should say, ballistic missile program, too. Um, so it, it, it uh, also has many trading partners among companies in the West. Um, the Europeans have always been eager uh, to find ways around the sanctions. Um, and so I, I, I don't really characterize Iran as having been isolated. Uh, will it bolster the rivalry in the Caspian region? Ah, yes. Well, 
Um, as I alluded to a little bit before, the, the rivalries in the Caspian region um, center um, in part, at least, uh, on, on uh, the oil reserves. Um, you know, they're so plentiful around the Caspian and, and all the neighboring countries that border on the Caspian, including Iran, of course. Um, that has yet to be uh, settled. Um, those rivalries will, will remain and the difficulty of negotiating uh, a, a division of, of the oil resources under the Caspian uh, have yet to be worked out. Um, and then in addition, uh, you know, other regional rivalries having to do with um, outright fear of, of Iranian hegemony in the region and, and those other countries that um, uh, are concerned about that, that rise to hegemony with the apparent backing of the United States administration um, I think that's going to continue to be a concern for the region um, and um, unfortunately um, lead to uh, dissension um, and, and, and a difficulty in resolving relationships, uh, at least for the near future. This is a very, really difficult process. I mean, this, uh, the process which leads to a, a potential um, agreement. Uh, but uh, how do you think, uh, this, uh, let, let's see from the West, uh, the, your Western view, so who will be the winning side or who will benefit much in this deal? Well, obviously Iran would come out um, the winner if it is able to flout six United Nations Security Council resolutions that demanded it halt all nuclear enrichment, and now if it's to be allowed to continue enrichment, um, that certainly is a victory. Um, the, the other things that, that would accrue to the Iranian regime's benefit, of course, are the ability, as I mentioned before, to keep all its centrifuges, uh, to develop newer, faster, better ones, um, to keep its entire stockpile of enriched uranium that it already has, um, to uh, keep on building at Iraq the nuclear or the uh, plutonium heavy water reactor facility. Um, it would uh, be able to complete uh, or to keep its facility underground, the enrichment centrifuge facility at Bardo. Um, it would be able to uh, continue developing its ICBMs, which are not even on the table for discussion at all. And we have also with us today Sidki Shevget, who is the editor-in-chief and the head of the Azeri Daily News site and uh, also holds a PhD in law, I understand. Nice to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here with you today. Some people are unsure about how things will develop if Iran is going to uh, accept the um, demands by the international community to, to adhere to the, the, the requests, the, the agreements, or is it going to continue with its nuclear program regardless as others, others believe? What is your take on that? Uh, in matter of sanctions, right? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, obviously, uh, Iran, uh, one must uh, say first of all that Iran has uh, proved uh, during the last uh, 30 years, while it was under the regime of sanctions, uh, that it is uh, a country with a great economic potential. So, uh, if the sanctions are removed, uh, it is obvious uh, that Iran is uh, going to achieve a very high level of economic development. And uh, it is uh, important, in my opinion, to see that uh, Iran might become a very attractive country for foreign investors as well. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm not only speaking about its huge oil and gas reserves. Uh, I mean, during so many years of living under Western sanctions, this country proved that it can sustain its economy. I mean, not everything is uh, quite uh, as well as the people of Iran uh, might have uh, wished for. But the country has still been developing, uh, despite all the sanctions, despite all this uh, negative imagery and so on. You say Iran is, is a sound economic partner, but is it a sound political partner? It is a pragmatic partner. That's very important. The uh, recent uh, nuclear negotiations, uh, the negotiations between Iran and uh, P5 plus 1 group of countries, have proved that... Uh, uh, pragmatism is one of the characteristics uh, which is inherent to the Tehran authorities. Despite all the ideological uh, differences that Iran might have with the West and vice versa, 
Uh, the agreement, the framework agreement has been reached. It hasn't uh, been reached. There has been no agreement reached yet. There, there isn't a single version of the agreement. There, there, there are several versions. We don't know which is the correct version. So we're not there yet. Uh, how, how can you say that we've reached an agreement when we haven't, in fact, reached an agreement? Well, we reached the framework agreement, obviously, and which is a very uh, big step forward. And I believe that uh, by the, uh, uh, by the uh, June the 31st date, they would uh, uh, probably actually achieve the final agreement. Do you believe that the, the P5 plus 1 and Iran will sign this agreement in June? Uh, I believe, yes, they might. I mean, despite all the recent statements by uh, Khamenei and uh, Rouhani, I mean, they have been uh, saying about uh, that they want all the sanctions uh, being lifted at this very uh, time of signing this particular final agreement. Uh, but uh, I don't think that they would actually, uh, how to say, uh, enforce that uh, position on the West. It's more like... Um, bargaining tool. Some people in the West are cautious about Iran's promising to uh, stop its uh, uranium enrichment. They have been moving forward despite all the opposition from uh, uh, both conservative circles in Iran itself, uh, from uh, the conservative circles in the United States, the Republicans in Congress, uh, despite whatever Israel have been saying all, all these years they still have achieved uh, what they have achieved. They have moved forward because that is in the interest of the West, which is uh, trying to uh, solve some of the regional problems with the help of Iran, maybe. Uh, it is in the interest of Iran itself, in, from the economical point of view as well, to get the sanctions uh, lifted. And so on. So they. Uh, could you please specify? So, which? What was the major drive to push, to push forward these talks, these Geneva talks? Well, uh, of course, uh, mostly uh, the most important thing uh, was uh, that uh, certain, uh, the right people were at the right uh, place at the right time. If we look at historically. Uh, in the past, uh, there was a reformist president, Hatami, who wanted to have negotiations with the West uh, uh, about the Iranian nuclear program. But President Bush at the time uh, didn't agree to that. Later on, when President Obama wanted to have negotiations, maybe some sort of negotiations with Iran about the nuclear program, there was President Ahmadinejad in Tehran who didn't want those negotiations. So it finally came down to Obama and the new president of Iran, Rouhani, who were the right people at the right place at the right time. You're not bothered that Iran will eventually become a nuclear power? A nuclear, mil well, uh, mil nuclear military power? Well, uh, at the moment, uh, Iran is uh, still saying that it is not pursuing uh, this goal of having... Uh, nuclear weapons. I mean, uh, the point is that uh, at this junction it is, um, wouldn't be right to say that it is pursuing this, you see? That's the whole point. And if eventually um, it becomes a nuclear power, then, uh, frankly speaking, I don't think that anybody in the world can do anything about it in the end. But still, at the moment it's not feasible in my opinion. I mean, with the number of centrifuges for enriching uranium being uh, uh, decreased and uh, their need to have the sanctions lifted, they will simply not pursue this goal. Iran is in the halfway of signing this agreement, so there is a framework agreement and there are also many supporters of this agreement and uh, many think that Iran will sign this agreement with the West at, la at, least, uh, um, at last after 30 years of uh, isolation, let's say. How do you view Iran, uh, Iran's future, Iran's economy in the Caspian? So will it become a reliable partner, economic partner for the West after lifting sanctions? Uh, I believe yes, because uh, the West uh, needs Iran. It needs Iran's uh, oil and gas reserves. Uh, Iran is the, uh, in terms of uh, its uh, gas, uh, proven gas reserves, it is in the second place in the world with uh, approximately 17% uh, of uh, proven world gas uh, reserves being uh, in Iran. 
Uh, it's also in the fourth place uh, uh, in terms of uh, having uh, uh, the oil, proven oil reserves, uh, that is uh, roughly 10% of the world's total proven petroleum reserves. Uh, so, in the end, uh, now, now, of course, the European Union at the moment is uh, trying to uh, build what they call uh, energy security. And this energy security means uh, that uh, they has, uh, have to diversify the flows of uh, energy resources. Will Iran be able to replace Russia or other suppliers in this game? Well, it's not uh, the matter for replacement, it's the matter of uh, being added to this supply chain, you see. Uh, some people say that the European Union is trying to uh, actually cease buying gas from Russia. No, they're not going to cease uh, buying gas from Russia. They just want to have uh, many sources of energy supply, so uh, the market is balanced and no single supplier is actually dominating the market and uh, is dictating its own terms. How do you appease the, the, the fears of, of some of the Western countries about Iran's uh, militantism? Uh, Iran's constitution calls for, for the um, spreading of, 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 of the Islamic Republic. Uh, world domination it, it's in their constitution how would you appease the how would you appease the fears of westerners who, who fear that well uh, i suppose that can be done with the fact that uh, iran uh, well uh, hasn't been uh, too active i mean it has been active uh, in lebanon in the region i mean now there are some uh, problems <laughs> in uh, yemen of course but uh, the point is that uh, again Pragmatism is a cornerstone of this particular uh, question. And my final question to you, uh, Sergei, yes. how do you think uh, so this agreement, which is expected to come uh, and to be inked um, in June, uh, how will it contribute to peace processes throughout the world? Well, um, of course, uh, that would uh, be important mainly for uh, those uh, parts of the world uh, where Iran itself has certain influences. Uh, lifting of the sanctions and bringing Iran back to the international political arena uh, might um, help uh, Iran to be, uh, how to say, more vocal in regional affairs. It has certain influences over, uh, say, Hezbollah movement in Lebanon. It has certain um, links which it denies with Hamas, with the Houthis in uh, Yemen, for instance. So. Uh, in a sense, uh, if uh, an, uh, a deal is possible with Iran on its nuclear program, then uh, all other sorts of uh, political and economic deals might also be possible. And uh, as I said, uh, in terms of the Caspian status, uh, Iran might be more favorable towards Azerbaijani point of view. So being part of the uh, uh, geopolitical arena of the world might also uh, move Iran towards uh, facilitating uh, certain uh, peaceful agreements uh, in other regions as well, where it has influence. As you see, Claude, some people are optimistic, some people are pessimistic, but the process is on. Yes, but the question is, which process is on? The, 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 as, as Claire was, was Claire Lopez was saying at the beginning of, the, of this uh, show, was that mm -hmm. There, there are various versions of, of the agreement, and everybody's reading something different. They're not, they're not all on the same page. Quite literally, they're not on the same page. But I think the political readers of the countries are ready to sign this deal as their statements on the top-level show, and I think that it will happen anyway. Well, it will happen, but it won't happen, because uh, Iran wants it to happen, the United States wants it to happen, Obama wants this to be his legacy as, as he leaves office, to say, I've done something positive, I've, I've signed on mm -hmm. with, 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 with Iran. But again, every, everyone is, is reading a different scenario. Time will show again. Indeed, time will tell, and we can only wish for a better tomorrow. Goodbye.